Okay, let's go. It's time to drop into our oil and gas predictions for 2026. Let's go. Oil and gas predictions for 2026, what I got right and what I got wrong last year in 2025. So for last year, number one, IRA fallout, nailed that one. Number two, uh, big tech companies are going to become big natural gas companies. I nailed that one too because of the data centers. We saw that coming years ago. Number three, blunts to BTUs. Got that one wrong. I thought the commercial marijuana industry was going to boom. They need cheap, reliable, abundant electricity, just like the data centers. Plus, they need fertilizer, both of which comes from the oil and gas industry, but it's not there yet. Number four for last year, Shell and BP on the road to Houston. I got that one wrong. Um, I still think at some point both of these companies are going to move their headquarters to the U.S., and I think they'll end up in Texas and actually in Houston, but I think I was just way ahead of the curve there. Who knows? We'll see. Number five from last year. New administration is going to tank the price of crude. Yep. Drill baby drill really isn't good for the industry, but it's good for votes and it's good for prices at the pump. Um, number six for last year, deep water growth. Nailed that one. It's still going on right now. Number seven from last year, more refining capacity in the world, but unfortunately not in the U.S. I got that one right as well. Number eight from last year, CCUS is a side hustle that will turn to legitimate business. Got that one right. Number nine, the return of oil and gas manufacturing to the U.S. Unfortunately, I got that one wrong. The environment is still perfect for that. But what happened is with our current administration, the trade wars, the constantly moving tariffs, it just kept the U.S. from growing that manufacturing part of the, of the industry that I still think is there. I think the potential is still there, so we'll wait and see. But I got that one wrong. And then number 10 from last year, another day, another doomsday. Yep, I got that one right. Quite frankly, the world, the public is tired of hearing about the earth burning up, climate change, all that sort of stuff. So if you look at what I got right and what I got wrong last year, I got 70% of them right in 2025. Now, that's not as good as my usual trend. I usually get around 80% uh, percent, uh, right. And if you look at my last 12 years average, and yes, I've been doing this for 12 years, uh, my average is 79%, so I'm slightly below my average. Let's get into predictions of 2026, but before I get there, let me talk about pricing real quick. I think Brent's got average $59 a barrel, WTI's got average $67 a barrel, and that gas at the Henry Hub is going to be $3.95 per million BTU. And you go, Mark, that's higher than all the experts and analysts are saying. And that leads me into number one prediction for 2026, the great oil price plot twist. I think a lot of the experts out there, quite frankly, have it wrong. Yes, right now at the end of 2025, we're in an oversupply market. Uh, so there's more hydrocarbons on the market than there is demand. So prices are low. A lot of experts think that's going to continue all the way through 2026. I don't see that at all. I see the opposite happen. I see ha by the second quarter of 2026, uh, that oversupply will be gone. We have not spent resources, money, capital, uh, drilling time to uh, uh, drill a bunch of wells that are not completed yet. So there's no back supply. So once this oversupply is gone, we're not going to be able to backfill the world's demand. The price is going to go up. Harold Hamm, one of my fellow executives out there, said the same thing. He thinks in about 18 months the oversupply will be gone. I think in about six months it will be gone. Let's see who's right, me or Harold. Number two prediction for 2026. Balance sheet ballers. Pretty simple. Uh, we need ruthless business simplicity in our industry. Right now, and for the uh, last half of 2025, and for the unfortunately the first half of 2026, you're going to see the oil and gas industry strip out management layers. They have to integrate supply chain. Uh, they're having to um, do everything they can to increase margins. They're digitalizing operations with AI. And then all of this is being driven by the need for efficiencies. Typically, when we have layoffs in our industry, it's based on the price of crude. And what happens is it's very cyclic. The price of crude tanks. We lay a bunch of people off. The price of crude comes back. We hire these people back. That's not what's going on. Fundamentally, our industry is changing, but it's changing for the better. Now, one of the things that's going on is you see a lot of capital discipline. We're getting that to a little bit layer, but the industry itself is having to become more efficient, more reliable on technology, more integrated internally, but also externally with both their vendors uh, and their service supply partners. So uh, once again, I think you can see um, a, a boom in our industry in 2026. The next thing, uh, prediction number three for 2026, Texas, where servers go to sweat. You heard me right, servers. 
sweat. So if you look at the data center world, it's booming right now because of AI. You need a couple of things. We already covered the cheap, reliable, abundant electricity you need to run the data center, but you also need cheap land, surface land to build those data centers on. Now, so what you're looking for is an area in the world where you have cheap land prices, surface land prices, and access to natural gas uh, to generate your own electricity. What's happening is in Texas, especially West Texas, a lot of that land is arid, think of the Permian, and so it's not good for farming or ranching. So the surface layer uh, is not super valuable. Yes, uh, there's families that's been getting mineral rights royalties for maybe 100 years. Uh, yes, maybe some of them are selling uh, fresh water, maybe some have saltwater disposal wells, um, some of them have uh, lease roads, a uh, pipeline infrastructure, but really that surface land hasn't really been utilized to its best advantage. What's happening right now as, we're, as I'm filming this is data centers are being built in West Texas because they can get the surface land really cheap. And then they're able to get the natural gas they need to generate electricity because it's underneath their feet. Now the owner of the land is killing it. They're, they're still making money for mineral rights. Now they're being able to lease or sell the surface rights. The data center uh, companies, the Metas, the Facebooks, the uh, Microsoft, the Amazons, um, all of them are now building and investing in their own electrical generation infrastructure. We covered that last year on our predictions. And so because of that, I think Texas is going to lead the world in data centers. At some point in the future, it'll make fiscal sense for data centers to be built in outer space. Number one, it's easier to cool. You just dump, park them in the shade and all of a sudden you're able to cool them. Number two, solar, which works okay here on the surface of the earth, kills it in outer space because there's no atmosphere to get in the way. It'll be the best way to power a data center. But until we start building data centers in outer space, I think Texas is going to rule. Number four prediction for 2026, methane hydrate is going to be shell 2.0. And you go, Mark, what the hell is methane hydrate? Let me tell you. Imagine a molecule of methane, which is natural gas, surrounded by an ice crystal, right? This sounds like something a mad scientist would uh, um, create. Um, it's not. It's also called methane clatrate or fire ice. It's basically a crystallized ice structure formed naturally uh, in the environment that's holding methane. It happens deep in our world's ocean where the pressure is intense, the, the temperature is low, and there's methane uh, bubbling up from the earth. So I think methane hydrates can be the next big shell revolution. Now, here's a good place for me to stop and talk you through this. Remember, these are truly predictions. I'm not saying that methane hydrate is full bone blizzness right now. What I'm saying is it's very the very beginning of this in, of this industry, this methane hydrate industry. All of my predictions are stuff I'm trying to uh, uh, figure out what's going on when they first start. So everything I'm saying here, I think it's starting 2026. It doesn't mean it's gonna be running wide open or hit its full potential yet. But uh, that methane hydrate is gonna be huge. That's the whole reason China is uh, uh, really upset about any uh, activity in the China Sea because the, the seafloor is littered methane hydrate. It's all over the world in our world's oceans, and we haven't figured out the way to capture it uh, at scale outside of the lab, but we have figured out a way to capture it in the lab. And it's only a hop, skip, and jump before we actually start scaling this and make it the next hydrocarbon revolution. It's going to be amazing. Number five, more money, less spending. You heard me right. More money, less spending. The oil and gas industries will be cash flush in 2026. We're going to kill it upstream, midstream, downstream, the service companies. However, everybody's learned their lesson, and our industry is changing, and our world is changing. So you can see prices go up, but you can see external spending budgets go down. Why? Because we show a lot of capital discipline. The big companies are going to use this cash to buy back shares, to make strategic investments, to do mergers and acquisitions. The smaller companies are going to pay off debt. And so even though 20 2026 is going to be a boom year for the industry. If you're depending on the oil and gas companies to spend money for your livelihood, like we do at OGGN, 2026 is not going to be a fantastic year. It's going to be an average year. Now, with all that said, by 2027, 2028, you're going to see a lot more external spending. It'll probably be on things we haven't even thought of yet. It's going to be heavy on tech. Also, a subprime acreage all around the world in the shell place. So we're getting there. So number six, low carbon. Sorry, you just get a participation trophy. So CCUS is a legitimate business. It makes money, it's scaling. It will continue to grow. That carbon dioxide business is not just dependent on oil and gas. It's used in brewery, baking, uh, fire extinguishers, uh, a lot of commercial uses. However, have you noticed a lot of companies, especially in the oil and gas space, have promoted their low carbon strategy? Does that sound familiar? Does this sort of like uh, sound like promoting our ESG strategy or our DE&I strategy? Yeah, it does. And it's the same thing. This whole low carbon thing, 
thing. Um, it's a PR stunt and it's, it's getting ready to disappear and it's gonna disappear very quick. The budgets are already being slashed. So uh, unfortunately, low carbon, all you get is a participation trophy. Number seven, as much as I hate to see this happen, American's petrochemical crown slips off. Look around you. I don't care where you are in the world while you're listening to this. If you look around you, 80% of what you see is either made from hydrocarbons or transported by hydrocarbons. And most of that is petrochemicals. It makes modern life possible. The U.S. forever has led in the production of petrochemicals. We do it uh, more efficient than anybody else. We do it more environmentally responsibly than anybody else. And we do it for a couple of reasons. One is we have deep water ports on all of our ocean, all of our coasts, right? Second is we have access to cheap, abundant hydrocarbons on our, literally in the U.S. itself. And then third, we were able to build these large petrochemical plants, ethylene crackers, um, because we have the land and the resources and the capital investment to do it. And we knew how to do it. Unfortunately, uh, because of geopolitical risks in the U.S., companies are deciding that it makes less sense to build new petrochemical plants in the U.S. and makes more sense to build them outside of the U.S. So for the first time, India and China are passing up in the U.S. for petrochemical production. And unfortunately, that trend is going to continue. It breaks my heart, uh, but it's the reality of the situation. Number eight prediction for 2026. The world discovers LNG and they return our phone calls finally. What do you mean by that, Mark? Here in the US, we got LNG down to the science. We have the cheap, abundant natural gas. We know how to pull that out of the ground environmentally responsibly, convert it into a liquid so it can be transported around the world in big ships. Uh, we have the export terminals, the LNG trains, uh, the deep water ports, all of that. So now we can share our natural gas abundance with the world, which is good for everybody. However, when that big ship gets on the other side of the, the world uh, loaded with LNG, it has to be offloaded, which means other countries have to build LNG offloading terminals. They then have to turn that liquidified natural gas back into a gas, so they have to build gasification plants, and then they have to build the infrastructure to take that gas and put it in their infrastructure so their people can use it for electricity, cooking, whatever, and the world hasn't caught up to that. So the world is opening the doors to American LNG, but there's a ton of infrastructure that needs to be built before they can actually tap into it. Germany's done a good job of getting ahead, but the rest of the world hasn't. So if you're in the infrastructure construction business, it's going to be a killer year for you in 2026. Focus on LNG and the X export infrastructures need to offload that. Then number nine, guess what? Generation Alpha, they want to work in the oil and gas industry. They realize that we're not dirty, heavy steel. They realize we're not destroying the planet. They think what we do is exciting. It's fun. It's heavy on technology. You get to travel the world, get to lot, do a lot of cool stuff that makes human life better. Yeah. But Generation Alpha is still in school. They're not in the workforce yet. Modal Point, my original market research company, has been tracking negative public perception with different generations since 2010. And for the first time, we've seen Generation Alpha, and I remember these are the ones that are still in school, their negative public perception has dropped down to 40%. That is amazing. What do we need to do? We need to nurture that and continue that. Negative public perception has affected us for 50 years now, and finally the trend is turning. Now the older generations, not so much so, but this new generation that's going to enter our workforce in the next Next few years are. So we need to make sure as an industry that we do things. Now, let me talk about a couple of things you may not think of. Landman, I don't want to hear how it's not accurate. I don't care. It shows our industry in a mostly positive way. A lot of kids see that and they like that. It's making our industry sexy and fun. The second thing is education. OGGN, along with all kinds of industry organizations for over 10 years, been educating the world on the benefits of the oil and gas industry. And finally, this younger generation's paid attention and they don't believe anything they see on social media. They fact check everything. So Generation Alpha is wanting to come work here. We have to open the doors, make them feel welcome, show them how cool and exciting this, and we have to keep this trend continuing to go. Um, there's, it's the first time since I've been in this industry, we've finally seen a drop in negative public perception, and we need to capitalize on that. And the cool thing about it, 55% of this Generation Alpha that wants to come work in our industry is female, not male. How cool is that? Then, finally, number 10, your grocery bill? That's the next president. What does that mean, Mark? For the last uh, almost six years since the pandemic, politicians have controlled energy policy, tariffs, regulation, rules, taxation, and they've increased the price of, of energy to the entire world. That's increased the price of everything to the world. And the general public is tired of it. Look out there, look at what's going on in Europe. Look what's going on here in the US. Look what's going on in Africa, Brazil. The public is sick and tired of politicians making things more expensive. So what's happening is that affordability is gonna be in the driver's seat for policy uh, for the energy industry 
globally. Now, remember, I'm saying it's just starting. I'm not saying that it's hit full stride yet. But because of that, we should see more common sense policy. We're, we're going to see policies um, that hurt our industry that made no sense disappear because the general public wants to go back to cheap, abundant, reliable energy, which is what we had for a very long time. And as our population grows, they're going to see more and more of that. So you can see less political influence into what's going on in the oil and gas industry and more common sense. And that is a blessing. So I just went through my top 10 predictions for 2026 for the oil and gas industry industry. Uh, somewhere below, depending on where you're watching this, you'll see links uh, to bring you back to the original blog posts. And in the blog post, you can go back and there's links to my last uh, 12 years of doing these predictions every year. Uh, some of the stuff I've gotten wrong is really funny. Some of the stuff I've gotten right is almost psychic. I'm not psychic. I just, I've been in this industry 25 years and I talk to leaders literally on every day. But if you like this, let me know. Comment on this. What do you think about my 10 predictions for 2026? What do you think I got right? What do you think I got wrong? Uh, thank you for watching and we will see you next time.